We've just been through the worst recession since the 1930s, leaving the UK with eye-watering debts. Now the government has weighed in with the toughest budget for decades. Over the next three weeks, we'll be exploring what this means for family budgets. How will it affect our pay and wages? What about our spending, our mortgages and other debts? What are the prospects for our savings and our pensions? We're going to look at how the country's fortunes will affect our own and what, if anything, we can do about it. We'll try to show you how to beat tough times. Tonight, earning it, the Money Watch team report from around the country on what's really happening to our jobs and pay. The downturn was bad enough. Will the recovery be even worse? People say money doesn't matter, but money does matter. Without money, you can't live. Who's worth what? Our Citizens Pay Commission decides. Do you deserve a good salary, and why do you think you do? I work more or less 12-hour days, six days a week. With our budgets being squeezed, money expert Martin Lewis tries to boost one family's income. With 3,000 overspend, it would be very nice to get this to a 3,000 underspend. And could going it alone be the secret of survival? Hello and welcome to Money Watch. This week we're in Birmingham, Britain's second city and once the country's industrial heart. Like so much of the UK, it's taken a hammering during the recession with the biggest rise in unemployment outside London. Later, we'll be assessing the prospects for jobs here and across the country. But first, the most important element of our family budget, pay. Many employers are telling their workers to expect tighter settlements in the immediate future. But are people being paid what they really deserve right now? I'm in a new city centre business complex with a group of people who all do very different jobs. They range from a solicitor to a GP, an HGV driver to an air steward. I'm also joined by our own specially selected Pay Commission, a successful entrepreneur who last year drew a six-figure salary from his own business, a full-time mum and a bus driver who earns an average wage that's about £26,000 a year. Now their task is to rank their peers and to decide what they think this lot should be earning. All our professionals work in or around Birmingham and before our pay commission makes any decisions, each person has a chance to make their case for a better pay packet. Do you deserve a good salary and why do you think you do? I work more or less 12-hour days, six days a week. A doctor is what I am, not what I do. How long have you been an architect? 24 years. There's a lot of education, seven years to go through your training. How much does your job affect your social life? Massively. Massively. It's impossible to plan. It's not a nine-to-five job. What size a truck do you drive? 44 truck. If I make a mistake or lose concentrations and accidents, and a good chance somebody's going to be killed. I deal with um, high-value, complex litigation often involving disputes over a million pound. I've worked through the night until four or five o'clock in the morning. We are taught all the bacteria. Do you find your job emotionally draining? You see people die. You can be working with somebody, cleaning their room for six, seven weeks, and they pass away, but you've got to know them people. Is this life one long party, or is it? Yeah. Or, uh, <laughs> no, it's not as glamorous, is it? People always make out. As an air steward, um, you're responsible for the safety and security of everybody on board. Do you think you should be paid more than most of the people that are standing here behind you? All I would say is footballers are paid too much. <laughs> OK, all our professions, thank you for joining us. And our pay commission, time now for you to decide what this lot are all worth. You've got £330,000 divided up. Everyone has agreed to reveal their personal salary, apart from the architect and the solicitor, who have chosen to talk averages. The money our pay commission has to divide up is roughly the same as the total of our professional salaries. This means if our commission gives one profession a rise, another faces a salary cut. Let's face it, nobody likes solicitors, do they? <laughs> I was impressed with the architect. We wish Moving she down down the park. I like okay. her. I think she works hard. Yeah, but how many hours does she work a day? 
I, I don't agree to be quite honest. But... Is this guy a party animal, really? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, it's he, a perk he, of the job, but when you're on board and you're working, that is a massive, massive safety issue with planes, isn't it? How's this exercise been for you? Extremely it's difficult. been extremely difficult. Lots of arguments. <laughs> and are you worried about offending any of them? Yes. <laughs> There's some winners and some losers. Right, moment of truth then. Hospital cleaner, and we give you... 32,000. Your actual salary? 13,000. Whoa, that's uh, more that's... than double. If trusts paid or governments paid for every domestic to have wages like that, you wouldn't have clean hospitals, you would have palaces. Straight away, the Commission is giving substantial pay rises. 16! You're giving them some good pay rises. What do you make of that? Um, that's brilliant. £30,000. But other professions face cuts. OK, next up. Architect, we give you... £42,000. The salary that is average architect is £45,000. It's a £3,000 pay cut. I'm quite disappointed. You scored a bit lower on stress. We felt that you probably had a lot of job satisfaction and reward. It isn't an easy ride. It's a long, difficult and often unrewarding. From our point of view, we've only loaned it £3,000. So okay. On a general... So you're happy? Level. You think it's fair? Yes. Sorry, architect. Um, if you'd like to stand next to the hospital cleaner... right. We've reached our commission's final top three earners. Our next one is solicitor. And we give you... £53,000. £85,000 is the average for an equity partner. Now we're down to the last two. Plumber. And Second spot. How much are you giving him? We give you £58,000. What I really get at the moment is £25,000. They've more than doubled his salary. But why? He's on call 24-7. You could be having a cup of tea on a Sunday morning and they'll go out and do a job. Would you pay his bill if it was twice as big? We rewarded the plumber for hard work and long hours and always being there. How much have you awarded our GP? GP, we have given you... £70,000. Now, your real salary is... is £102,000. That's a painful £32,000 pay cut. So you've had a very good socialist approach to it. Is that what it was? I, I'm going to try to congratulate them. But, but actually, if you put me down 30000 that's fine, because I give away a lot of money. It means I'd have less to give away. Our pay commission has narrowed the salary spread. Low earners have got more, and high earners have had pay cuts. But in the real world, it's a different story. Now, we want to delve into your pay packet to try and work out whether it's likely to grow or to shrink. This wave shows how much everyone in Britain earns. The higher the wave, the more people earn that wage. Average or median pay is £490 a week. That's just under £26,000 a year. As we move along the wave, wages rise. But look, the number of people earning them falls away. And the line could go on and on and on, because some people in Britain are extremely well paid. But what about the rest of us? Can we expect a pay rise? Well, if you work in the public sector and you're one of the majority who earns more than £21,000 a year, don't hold your breath. Because of the government's freeze of public sector pay, you shouldn't expect your pay to rise until at least the end of 2012. But in the private sector, things are a bit brighter. Some experts say your pay may increase by as much as 4% this year, and by another 4.2% next year. But there are regional variations. If you live in South Wales, any pay rise you get could be substantially less than this. That's because it's reckoned to be one of the worst places in the country for pay increases alongside Bolton and Wolverhampton. Things are a lot brighter in Norwich, Aberdeen and Milton Keynes. Here, higher than average pay rises are forecast. To look in more detail at what's happening to our earnings, we've focused in on the market town of Banbury in Oxfordshire. 
This is how business once used to come to the historic market town of Banbury. Its economy depends today on tourism and one of the hardest hit sectors of the nation's economy, manufacturing. Hundreds of jobs were lost here, but the majority stayed in work. What I'd like to know is for the typical resident, did the recession make them worse off? And will the recovery make them better off? There's a reason I've come to Banbury. It's because average wages here, as well as unemployment rates, closely match the figures across the country. What the recession did financially to people in Banbury reflects what's happened to the rest of us. Andy Rivers knows firsthand how hard the recession has bitten. Sessions at his boxing club have become a luxury item. I moved to Bambi in 1994, ironically for work, and um, there was a lot of choice available then, but there's not now. I was working for a company called ProDrive, uh, helping to run their stores and a motorsport company, and obviously with the credit crunch they lost a lot of their core business. Uh, so unfortunately they had to let a lot of people go last year and I was one of them. But since then I've done a lot of the agency work, driving, labouring and factory work. Uh, financially it's been a big drop in salary, roughly 40% of what I was on. So I um, had to tighten the old belt a bit, unfortunately. And belt tightening has meant that the gym is now on the brink of closure. Gym is something that people don't really need, it's something that is an extra. I thought that may, may be because my gym was the cheapest in town. I thought everybody from the major gyms would come into my gym, but it, it didn't quite work that way. Stuart Kidman feared he'd be far worse off in the recession. The biggest advertising slump in decades hit his industry hard. He was working on a local paper. But just after the birth of his son, William, he got some bad news. I came home to find a message on my phone from my boss and uh, he was very apologetic and he said I'm really sorry but it looks like your job could be under threat. We just moved into our new house at that stage and obviously new baby things were looking pretty bleak. But things quickly looked up for Stuart. He heard about a job on camping and caravanning magazine. I was absolutely elated when I was told that I'd got the job here. Yeah, it was a brilliant day. This job had a significant pay rise for me. It was about 40% above what I was being paid before. And with that big pay rise, he's thinking of buying a house. With a couple of semi-detached. We had a good recession, if you can call it that. But we are quite confident now that our salaries are such that we can afford a decent house, a, big, a bigger house, more than we, we have at the moment. Stuart's pay went up just as the cost of living fell, so his money could stretch a lot further. Was that just a fluke, or did other people get better off too? We asked the financial consultant, Jonathan Davis, what was happening to the average family. So what's this graphic all about, Jonathan? It's showing us the amount of money that people have got in their pockets after paying their taxes and after their mortgage costs. So disposable income, in other words. Absolutely. Hang on, this is going up in the middle of 2009, which was the depth of the recession. Well, that was when the Bank of England slashed the interest rates from 5% to 0.5%, and of course mortgages went through the floor. So that meant we had more disposable income? Exactly. Are you telling me in the recession we actually had more spending power? It's a, it's a funny recession. People actually didn't really feel the recession because they had more money in their pocket. So unless you were in the unlucky minority and lost your job, the likelihood is that your spending power, the amount of goods you can buy for what you earn, actually went up in the recession. But will that carry on in the recovery? Jonathan Davis doesn't think so. I don't think pay is going to rise dramatically going forward. I think the lower paid will probably do better than the higher paid. And I think those who are not earning at all will find it increasingly difficult. So if Stuart's income has gone up in the recession, should he spend it on a house? Jonathan Davis is less optimistic than most. Simple fact is, our forecast is for a 30% fall in house prices, nationally and locally. 
So that could really be significantly detrimental to your long-term finances. It's a gloomy prediction. What does that make you think? Well, it's worrying actually. It's worrying. With 30%, it's a big chunk. For the gym owner Dave Earl, the next few years could be make or break. What was your income before the recession and then what happened to it? Before the recession, I was taking in probably £2,500 a month through gym memberships. After the recession kicked in, it had gone down to £4,500, so about £450 a month. The biggest thing for you is whether or not the consumer is going to start spending again. Would that be a fair statement? Yeah, yeah that's, fair. that's a fair statement. Yeah. I'm not convinced that the consumer is going to get going at all much um, going forward, and money is going to be very, very tight. Andy Rivers' financial state depends overwhelmingly on one thing, getting a job. How's it felt trying to find work in these times? It can be quite demoralising sometimes and that a lot of employers just won't get back to you at all. I'm seeing big rises in unemployment generally. I'm seeing a dip in the economy, but anyone who could stay in work for as long as possible, get through this recession, then I think that's them going to be set because they're going to have the skills and the CV for the next 10 years. So while in the recession, average earnings rose and inflation fell, now in the recovery, inflation's higher and for millions, no pay rise. Are you telling me we're not going to see any benefit financially from the recovery? I am telling you that. I think we're going to see very big unemployment numbers. I think we're going to see a significant house price crash. Um, it's going to be pretty grim. A recession that feels good and a recovery that hurts. Let's hope the worst predictions are wrong. Perhaps I'll just stay on this boat. More from Andy later. Well, I'm joined now by the personal finance expert, Paul Lewis, and Linda Yu, who's an economist at Oxford University. Hello to both of you. Paul, the blunt truth is that we're all going to be paying more tax, and most people will have less money in their pocket. Yes, people are going to be worse off. And if you look at the official figures in the budget book, at the very lowest end of income, we're going to be £200 a year worse off. At the higher end, £1,600. And £200 at the lowest end will feel a lot worse than £1,600 at the highest end. And people who are used to spending money will spend less. That will depress the economy. If you're on benefits, a lot of those are either going to be cut, taken away, or they're not going to go up as fast as inflation uh, used to be measured. So that will they will seem worse off. So I think overall, we are all going to be worse off and the government makes no secret of that. And Linda, you, how long do you think this will go on for? I think we are going to suffer in terms of income for quite a few years. And that's because the financial crisis that we've just gone through has created a credit crunch, which is going to make it very difficult for businesses to create jobs. And so that means very slow economic growth for at least the next five years, which of course means lower incomes and lower wages for really everybody. Will it get worse, though, before it gets any better? I'm afraid it will, because at the moment, if you look at how low interest rates are, these are the lowest interest rates for four centuries. So it's really helped people through this recession by keeping mortgages cheap, by allowing uh, households to repay their debts. Now, however, interest rates will have to go up because this is not a normal rate. So when that happens, the slow income growth plus higher interest rates will make most people feel as they have less money in their pockets. And however, if this carries through and as the economy begins to pick up, towards the end of this parliament, then I think things will begin to look better, but not for several years yet, I'm afraid. In a way, Paul, we're at, we're at the beginning of all this. Do you think people have any sense of, of how painful it can get? No, I don't think they do. And I think particularly people on the lower incomes where benefits are an important part of their finances, because of the way they're going to rise more slowly, that will be cumulative. They'll be worse and worse and worse off every year. And I don't think people have much idea of how that's going to affect them. And the Chancellor has warned us that this is not the end. There are going to be more welfare cuts. We're also going to see cuts in services, which many lower income people depend on, and the taxes as well. That is going to be a cumulative thing. We're going to have more and more tax taken off us. And, and we'll, we will just have to get used to that. We're going to have more tax, less money. Paul Lewis, Linda Yu, thank you. Now Justin. So while the downturn is keeping a lid on most people's income, that's certainly not true for everyone. We all know about big bonuses for bankers, but the bosses of many of Britain's other big companies have been collecting ever fatter pay packets as well, with the government bearing down on public sector pay and even cutting cabinet members' salaries. What chance of restraint in private sector boardrooms? Here's Libby Potter. 
Marks and Spencer has struck a 15 million pound deal with its new boss, Mark Bolland. Has shattered British records for executive pay after taking home more than 90 million pounds. BG Group Chief's 28 million deal fuels anger over executive pay. Over the last year, the bosses of FTSE 100 companies enjoyed a rise of 7% to their already bulging pay packets. And in the last six months, their bonuses have gone up 22% too. There's widespread anger about top earners' pay. That's because they sometimes get huge rewards, even when companies make losses. And it's also because they're doing conspicuously well when so many others are feeling the pinch. In 2009, even in the depths of the recession, the average pay for the boss of a FTSE company was £2 million, and 81 times the average worker's wage, a gap that has risen sharply. So what's the justification for huge pay rewards? One is that when bosses do well, their companies generate profits and jobs. These adverts are some of the most iconic on British TV and help shift billions of pounds of products and services every year. The holding company behind them is marketing giant WPP. It made nine billion pounds last year and boss and founder Sir Martin Sorrell's pay was nearly 20 million pounds. I never wanted to run a small business. I always wanted to run a big business. But do you really have to be earning hundreds and hundreds of times what the lowest paid member of the company is earning for it to be a success? Let's get this right for a minute. We started a company in one room with two people. Mm -hmm. right? We are now responsible, either directly or indirectly, for 140,000 people yeah. in 107 countries. We have created jobs. We haven't destroyed jobs. Right? Mm -hmm. We haven't cre created. So we took a risk. And the wealth that's created by companies like WPP benefits not just employees, but people throughout the country. The millions of us who have shares or contribute to a pension want publicly owned companies to prosper. When they do well, we do well. Despite the benefits we may receive from company success, pensions, jobs, tax revenues, there's still the overwhelming feeling that huge corporate pay deals are excessive and unfair and that they weaken the sense of common purpose in British society. Now some institutional shareholders have decided to act. The Church Investment Group, which has billions of pounds invested in FTSE company shares, has published a report claiming top pay is too high. This whole question of injustice, I think, is uh, a key feature of the report. Those at the bottom end, maybe they're not being treated that well. Um, though we look at people at the top end with large executive pay packages, it's not, it's the differential between the two which is, is a cause for concern. Bosses say it's a competitive world and without attractive pay, top talent will simply pack up and leave. But the charge is that too many bosses sit on the remuneration committees which set pay and on the boards that approve their decisions. That's not something Sir Martin Sorrell readily accepts. We're not sort of fat cats that sit around a boardroom table and sort of dole out great rewards to one another. We operate in the market. You know, I, I do find the thing actually a little bit offensive. We have to remain competitive. The new government doesn't look set to meddle with the market on private sector top pay. So ultimately, it may be down to big shareholders and pension funds to take action. But how likely is that? What we will be doing in the Methodist Church is to vote our shares in accordance with our overall policy. So it's this, this voting is the way in which we're able to express our um, opinions in a visible way to companies. Sadly, most shareholders don't really vote against the company um, board when it comes to these uh, matters. So it seems top pay will continue to grow. 
But David Charters, who used to run an investment bank, thinks rather than ostentatious bonuses, rewards will come in other guises. There's much more concern about perception and presentation rather than a fundamental change in behaviour. There'll be more of a temptation to take pay in the form of shares or deferred payments, deferred incentives, much more that's performance related. But when you get to the bottom line, to the actual number that's delivered to the individuals, maybe it's two or three years out rather than this year, those numbers I don't think will be significantly lower than they have been in the recent past. So whilst most of us face minimal pay rises or even pay freezes, top bosses look set to enjoy a more comfortable ride as their earnings continue to accelerate. Well, for people further down the pecking order, those facing pay cuts and pay freezes, what can be done to ease the pain? Over the next three weeks, the money expert Martin Lewis will be spending time with three generations of the same family. His mission? To magic up some extra cash. It's a family day out, but on a budget. Like many people, this lot have been hit by the recession. Anne-Marie Merriman, who gave up work two years ago to be a full-time mum, and her husband Graham are struggling because Graham's income has dropped by more than 30% since the downturn. The recession has affected us massively. We're a one-income family. Uh, I work in recruitment. It's very sales orientated. So again, the recession has affected recruitment. So everything that we've done has been to a, a very tight budget. We don't have that extra cash to do the nice things that we'd like to do. And um, we just live day to day and do the mundane things and try and save money where we can. Savers are among the hardest hit by the recession. Gloria and Colin are Anne-Marie's parents. He's a retired architect and she's a retired teacher. And as pensioners, they're worried about the funds for their retirement because their savings and investments have dropped by nearly £40,000. Money we had in ISAs seemed to have plummeted. Things like HBOS shares that we had have just disappeared. Um, we must have lost about 17, 18,000 on those. We're hoping now at our stage of life to be able to enjoy ourselves a bit more and have holidays and things. Their son William, an engineer, and his sister Christina, a teacher, are desperate to buy a house and move out of their parents' home in Luton. But they've got more than £30,000 in student debt between them, and the interest they're paying on it looks set to rise with inflation to around 4% this autumn. There we go. I've got this huge debt, but I want to get on the housing market, I want to get somewhere, I want to get on with my life. I think probably I don't save as much as I should do. So probably save a bit more and then I can get on the house, housing ladder sooner. Well done. We're kind of stuck at the moment with the folks. <laughs> Today they're enjoying themselves, but like many families, problems are mounting. They're already struggling to make ends meet and the budget could cost Anne-Marie and Graham alone an extra £1,200 a year. They need some help with their personal finances. Here's a man for the job. Martin Lewis is a money-saving specialist, and he's on his way to meet our family. He's been advising the nation for years on the basic rules of managing the household books. It's really quite simple. Step one, do a proper budget. Work out what's coming in, what's going out. Step two, look at everything you spend money on to see if you could get the same for less. And then once you've done that, step three, well, if you're still overspending, you have to start cutting back and changing your lifestyle. The family is meeting up at Amory's home in Redhill to complete a budget planner of their income and expenditure over an entire year. About this phone bill here. I know. That's your that was, part, that, that was a naughty phone bill, that was. That I'm having to look at figures that I don't normally take too much interest in. Once completed, the budget planner will reveal any deficit in the family's finances. I always say, let your finances drive what you do. Find out what your finances are first, and then live your life by how much money you've got.
Martin arrives in time to find out whether their income matches their spending. Hello. I'm Marie. I'm yeah. Martin. Pleased to meet you. Hello. Let me grab I'm that. Marie. Thank Everyone, you very much. Everybody's How's it going? Your budget planning, are you? Oh, uh, yeah. Fun. Making us work. What's the most shocking thing so far? Nappies and haircuts. <laughs> really? Obviously not me. I found it difficult to list my spending because I don't really keep track of it. But well, I think that's I'm... A, that's a... But I think I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Martin wants to show the family how even the small daily costs add up. £2.50 cappuccino every day that you go to work, how much does it cost a year? Like loads. Oh, is it? <laughs> £625 a year. What you could say is, would I prefer to have a cup of coffee every day from the coffee shop or would I prefer to have that £625 to go towards a better holiday? It's not for me to tell you what to do with your money, it's for me to try and enable you to get the most utility that you can out of your cash. So are the family overspending? Can Martin help them boost their income? We'll find out later in the programme. Well, of course, our income depends to a large extent on one major factor. Here's Justin. Let's take a closer look at what's happening to our jobs. Well, with the exception of 2007, unemployment has been increasing since 2005. And last year, it saw a sharp rise, with the recession pushing the jobless total up to 7.6%. And it's getting worse. In the year to April, unemployment reached 8%. That's two and a half million people out of work. It's the young who are worst affected. The number of 21 to 24 year olds out of work has increased by 50% since the recession began. Here in Birmingham, things are particularly bad. Remember the national unemployment figure, 8%. Well, here in Birmingham Ladywood, unemployment is currently running at 11.3%. And the North East is suffering as well, with unemployment in Middlesbrough up almost at 9%. Northern Ireland also has problems. Their unemployment in West Belfast is running at 9% as well. So here's the big question. Are things going to get any better? Well, the government's new economic advisers at the Office of Budget Responsibility think unemployment is only likely to rise by 0.1% this year. Not very much at all. Other economists, however, are much less optimistic. Some believe unemployment could be running at about 3 million by 2012. The worst hit areas are expected to be, look at this, Stoke, Hull, Wrexham, Wolverhampton and Bournemouth down there in the southwest, whilst London, Milton Keynes, Oxford and Chelmsford are expected to see relatively strong jobs growth. Well, some of the predictions for unemployment figures in the next few years are pretty alarming. But during the recession, there was some surprise and relief that even more people didn't lose their jobs. So how much of that was down to changes to the way we work? Here's Andy Verity again. Before the recession began to bite, John Alexander didn't have enough time for what he really wanted to do in life. Not work, extreme sports. Now that's changed. He's become a part-time worker. I got this feeling John might hold the clue to help me solve this mystery of why unemployment hasn't got higher. But I'll have to catch him first. All right, John. Good to see you, man. Sorry to stop you. That's all right. What are you doing running around here like a madman on a weekday? Well, uh, Fridays aren't for working anymore. <laughs> you don't have to work on a Friday? No. Uh, I, about a year ago now, I decided I wanted to take on something really serious, um, uh, an Ironman triathlon, and you need a bit more time for that. And yeah. work was getting in the way of that? Uh, yes. I mean, I, I wouldn't say totally getting in the way, but it certainly wasn't making the space for it. I mean, uh, there, there's, 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 there were more important things for me at the time that, that I, wanted to, I wanted to be able to pursue alongside. 
I would drop down to four days a week. I'd take a 20% pay cut and be able to, to essentially take back my Friday. John's in advertising, which has just been through the worst slump anyone can remember. And so what's the deliverable? Is it visual identity? Thousands of jobs were lost, but more would have gone if it weren't for people like him who made an unusual choice, losing money to gain time. Companies are going to be looking to, to trim out any spend that they can. And so if you go in and say, look, you can still have me committed four days a week, I'll take a 20% hit, it kind of, it could be a win-win for everyone. In advertising and other industries, employers asked staff to go part-time so they could cut their biggest cost, the payroll, without cutting jobs. Since the recession began, a quarter of a million more people are working part-time. So is that shift to part-time and flexible working a lifestyle choice or a question of survival? When the recession hit at the end of 2008, the Honda plant in Swindon, a big local employer, was affected badly. Sales dropped by more than a third and the cars stacked up. At the Honda plant in Swindon, more than two and a half thousand have been working their last shift before a four month shutdown to cut costs. To try and hold on to their skilled workforce, Honda bosses made a bold move, pay staff 85% of their wages to stay at home. The plant reopened in June last year. Dean Symes works in quality control. How did you feel when you heard that the closure was coming to an end? Relieved, I think, relieved and, yeah, a little bit emotional, I suppose, of, you know, it's finally over. We've got through the rough times. No company, though, can afford to pay staff not to work. There had to be a catch. Those hundreds of hours of paid holiday have to be repaid to Honda. There's no more money for overtime. Extra hours staff work just reduce the number of hours they owe the company. How many hours do you owe? I'm 150 hours I owe back to Honda. How long is that going to take you to repay? I, uh, many years, I think, yeah, many years. It, but it's chipping away at it slowly. Do you feel like you chose this or you just had to? We had to, yeah, we had to. The choice, it was that or, or leave. But uh, the money's coming in, that's my priority. Not as much money, though. Dean's more than £3,000 a year worse off because of the lost overtime and shift payments. Honda's workers have to get used to it. Flexible working may have started in the downturn, but it's here to stay. What's become obvious is that it's the power of one particular financial nightmare, losing your job in a recession, that's led to this willingness to work flexibly so you can get by on less and the employer can cut costs without costing as many jobs. But if the shift to flexible and part-time working has helped some to keep their jobs or even improve their lifestyle, it's very different for others who find they're forced to take part-time work just to stay off the dole. The drop in income leads to serious financial pressure. For them to listen to us. They, oh, they... For seven years, Catherine Orton was a full-time care worker in a council-run home for the elderly in Birmingham until it closed. This is one of the saddest things I have ever seen. I've not been back since I was made redundant. This used to be a residential home for 32 residents. It was one of the best places I've ever worked. As the residents were dispersed to new homes, Catherine expected to find a similar job. I thought I'd get a job quite easy because of my experience, but it's been an absolute nightmare. The hope is that people like you who lose their jobs in the public sector can find work in the private sector. Really? I would like to know where, because I have been trying. I've applied for 150 jobs and I've not had one reply from any of them. So in March this year, Catherine became an unemployment statistic. But it was a situation she couldn't adjust to. You feel useless and inadequate. And you come home sometimes. I come home and I can sit and cry. Because I know I'm useful. 
I know I'm fit. But what is it? After weeks of searching, Catherine finally came across a job at a restaurant, part-time. In the window was an advert for a cleaner. So I filled in an application form there and then, and I'm doing that, 15 hours a week. Still, at least it's work, I suppose. Yeah, if you got paid properly. It's minimum wage, £5.80 an hour. Um, my top line is £87.75. Then I get tax and insurance off of that. Catherine earned £375 a week as a full-time care worker. Her part-time work pays only a quarter of that wage, but she's no longer adding to the jobless figure. I've got one month where I know I can pay my bills. And then after that, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. I actually don't know what I'm going to do. It's not the job, it's the money. People say money doesn't matter, but money does matter. Without money, you can't live. And I know the government, when they're saying they're going to cut public sector workers' jobs, God help those people out there, because they are going to feel the same as I do. Our new willingness to work flexibly has helped employers to keep down their costs and it's also kept the unemployment numbers down. But the price of that new flexibility is often being paid by ordinary people accepting part-time jobs and a drop in income. And that might be a price worth paying if you can be sure of keeping that job. But in these times, that's a big if. For Catherine, there's nothing flexible about part-time work. Choosing shorter hours and lower pay might make sense if you earn good money. Her choice was work or don't work. As more people face the axe, going part-time will be less and less about choice, more and more about survival. I'm joined again by Paul Lewis and Linda Yu. Catherine's story is really going to resonate, isn't it, with a lot of public sector workers who are worried about losing their jobs. Well, yes, and we are going to see, even on government figures, probably 600,000 people out of the public sector. They're going to have to find a way to survive. Where are those jobs going to be? Now, they may be in the private sector, but as I think Catherine's story showed, that may well mean very low wages, probably no pension at all, and very hard work doing something that, where she feels really undervalued. And I think even if they get a job and they're out of the figures, they're not happy people. Linda, do you think that flexible working, part-time working, is that going to help at all in the, the employment figures? I think it will. I think that the fact we have such a flexible labor market, meaning people can move from job to job, get more than one job, has actually helped unemployment stay below three million because with this depth of recession, that was what was expected. However, again, this kind of flexible working may mean that employers are reluctant to create full-time jobs given how weak the economy is. So that could mean that the part-time job situation becomes much more permanent than when we would really want. And low salaries still. Well, low salaries, and what worries me is many people are going to be expected to come off benefit. They're going to be sanctioned if they don't leave benefit to get a job. And are those jobs really going to provide the income they need? And Linda, the government is predicting two and a half million private sector jobs over the next few years. But where are those jobs going to be? What industries? What, what sectors? I think that is a huge unknown. If the economy could create that amount of jobs, that would be a better job creation rate than in the boom years before this recession. So I don't actually think that is a very realistic number. Um, jobs will have to come from an economy which is rebuilding itself from the rubbles of a financial crisis. And that is no easy task and certainly wouldn't happen very quickly. It feels to a lot of people like a bit of a gamble, doesn't it? I think it is a gamble. And don't forget, many people are going to be told, get off benefit and get a job or your benefit will be cut. Where are those jobs? I think that is the big question. Paul Lewis, Linda Yu, thank you. Justin. So if the outlook for employment is so uncertain, Another option, if you're brave enough, is to go it alone, to set up business by yourself. Many people would think an economic downturn was the worst possible time to become an entrepreneur. Well, I've been to meet two people who couldn't disagree more. Angel Moore is a dog groomer with a difference. A former florist, Angel retrained and opened his shop in East Manchester last year, helped by the winnings from a local enterprise competition. Hiya, Angel. 
How are you doing? Justin, So have yeah. you got any clients in today? Yeah, this is uh, Spike. He's a British bulldog and he's going to come in for his bath now. Since Good moving boy. from home visits to opening his shop, Angel's business turnover has increased by a massive 417%. What amazes me, though, is you've done it all through one of the worst recessions anyone can remember. It's extraordinary. I researched all of my clients. I asked them, did you feel that I was providing a luxury service or a necessity? And 100% of them came back with necessity. Why do you think you're doing so well? Well, a dog like this is going to have his skin treated. He's, this, he's on the best shampoo that money can buy. He's got better shampoo than me. He's got better shampoo than me. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need much shampoo. <laughs> Angel wasn't alone in setting up shop last year. The North West has seen a real growth in new startups, with a 14% rise here in Manchester. In such a crowded marketplace, the key to success is offering something unique. At Barking Barbers, it's the ancient healing art of Reiki for dogs. Reiki is basically the laying on of hands, and um, it will work on the areas that he needs best. So if he had emotional problems, so this is going to work on that. Whether you're a believer or not, there's no denying that Angel's holistic approach has worked wonders for his business. And the dogs seem to like it too. See Angel, don't want to wait Spike. Unlike the recession of the early 1990s, the creation of new businesses right across Britain has actually accelerated over the last couple of years, which seems extraordinary when you consider that we've just been through one of the worst downturns in living memory. Business guru Doug Richard travels the country encouraging would-be entrepreneurs to start their dream ventures. There have been a lot more new startups in this recession than prior economic downturns. And it's somewhat a matter of speculation as to why. New business costs are simply lower than they were a decade or 20 years ago, mostly due to very straightforward things, the internet, improved communications. You also have a cultural change in the UK, not the least led by popular TV, The Apprentice, Dragon's Den, that has caused people to stand up and say, I can start a new business. With the economy still fragile, Doug believes it is new startups and small ventures that hold the key to economic recovery. If we permit small businesses and startups the economic freedom to start and grow, then we will grow our economy again. If we don't, we won't. Over the last year, the number of people starting new part-time businesses has increased by 10% across the country. Women seem to be at the vanguard of this army of new entrepreneurs, and it all seems very enticing. A money-spinning business to earn you a bit of extra income, run from a spare bedroom in your spare time. But is it really that simple? In January 2009, photographer Kirsten Rogers decided to set up a restaurant in her two-bed flat. Every week, she crams 32 guests into her living room while continuing with her photography job. Oh, right, they all ask what the peas are. They're pea aubergines. Hello, this is the underground restaurant. Welcome. She charges £30 a head and makes, on average, £300 a week. She employs several waitresses, including her daughter Sienna, and guests book online. Trout, sea trout, uh, baked in banana leaf. Kirsten uses Twitter and her blog for marketing. It seems to work and it's cost free. Kirsten. Hello, Hi, welcome yeah. to the underground restaurant. Thank you very much. So, this is where it all happens, eh? Yes, it is. Do come in. Happen? So, has it been straightforward, kind of setting this up and doing it? I've got a problem with London Transport. They patented the word underground. They're saying, I'm not allowed to call this the underground restaurant. Anything else? I've got my freeholder is not too happy with me doing this, and I guess that's a warning for other people. If I could sell alcohol, I'd make a lot more money. It would make all the difference. Kirsten has clearly had her share of problems, but the risks with setting up any small business are very high. We're standing in a room with a group of 150 plus potential entrepreneurs or small businesses. 12 months from now, if every of them started a business today, more than half of them will be out of business. That's the simple fact. 
cash flow is the biggest problem for new startups. And as VAT hits 20% next year, consumer demand could weaken. One secret to survival is to diversify. In addition to her restaurant, Kirsten has decided to put on a farmer's market. Once again, in her flat. I've got the, the guy who makes, makes cheeses in Peckham coming. So if somebody could put that up for his cheeses. Peckham Bleu. 2.8 million businesses are run from home in the UK and Kirsten is certainly making the most of hers. The cocktail bar on the ironing board in the bedroom. I got a temporary events license so I can legally sell alcohol today. Kirsten has sold 200 advance tickets online at £4 each. And slowly her house fills up with strangers. I mean, I can't believe how successful it is. I'm so excited. Almost 6% of us now run our own business and 2010 is on course to be a record year for startups. And the budget brought welcome new tax breaks for small firms. But times are set to get even tougher and as the financial squeeze tightens its grip, people are going to become even more careful with their cash. So do Kirsten, Angel and all those other new entrepreneurs have what it takes to survive? Hello, Barking Barbers. Angel thinks he's found a niche people will pay for in good times and bad. There's 10 million dogs in, in, in the UK. That's a lot of dogs. And uh, people are crazy about their dogs. So there's always going to be a market for the care of an animal. For Kirsten, survival is all about selling a little bit of luxury, but at bargain prices to customers fed up with austerity Britain. I don't think the recession's over. I think it's still very worrying, but I believe in myself and I believe I'm very resourceful and one way or another, I'll keep going. I'll be able to support my family. So if going it alone seems like a tall order and the squeeze on pay is putting your budget under pressure, is there any way to boost your income? Let's find out what answers Martin Lewis has come up with for our family. In Redhill, Martin Lewis has been putting our family through the financial ringer, crunching the numbers on their income and expenditure. What will the results show? Graham's income has dropped by a third from £75,000 a year to £50,000. So are he and Anne-Marie living beyond their means? Do you spend more than you earn? Shall we find out? Really? Yeah. OK, let's do it. But That's not too bad. That's all, eh? Hey. <laughs> it's not good, though. Because it's three thousand pounds. I thought it was going to be a lot worse than that. Actually. It may be less of an overspend than Anne Marie had feared, but it's not acceptable to Martin. It would be very nice to get this two or three thousand underspend. It's going to be yeah. difficult. That's a six yes. grand a year turnaround, and yeah. that's, that's pretty hardcore. So, how will Martin deal with that overspend? Step one: boosting income. Anne-Marie doesn't work, so Martin's taking her and Graham back to school for his ideas on how they can bring in more money. You're a teacher, aren't you? Yes, I am. Um, oh. I used to teach reception children. Now, a, a reception teacher probably earns, what, about £25,000 a year? It's somewhere in that ilk. The childcare costs are the problem, though, because obviously if you're at work, who's looking after the kids? Yeah. You're probably looking at, if you came back to work full-time, you, you might be after tax six, £7,000 a year better off. You know, what I know of teaching and how much time it takes to run a reception class, uh, I don't know whether it's worth the quality of life that we'd have as a family, knowing that I'd only earn an extra £6,000 a year. That doesn't sit very well with me. If going back to school to work isn't an option, Martin has other tips for earning cash. Got a, a little list I know made in my pocket of other things you could do to boost your income relatively easily. Just right. quick one, snap. Right, yeah. you're ready. Yeah. I'm going to give me a score out of 10 for the concept of doing each of these. Get a cashback credit card, set up a direct debit to pay it off in full at the end of the month so there's no interest, so that every time you spend you get up to 5% back in cash. Nine. Right, doing that. You're going to set that up when we finish it. 
going through the house, anything that you don't use, selling it on eBay or Amazon? Nine. Have you done it? No. I want you doing that one as well. There is a Rent Your Driveway website which brings people together to give parking. Score? Ten. Ten. Oh! You could rent out your car as well, I should let you know. If you're not using your car, let you rent your car out to other people. You get really good rates for that. Putting your house as a set for filming locations. Oh, I'd like that one. That would get an 11. That would get an 11, you'd that. <laughs> online market research. Doing surveys when you've got a spare hour online and being paid for it. You know, people make about 250 quid a year if they're really quite dedicated, so it's not big money. Comping for cash. Entering hundreds of competitions. Oh, I do, I do that, actually. <laughs> How professionally do you do it? Not. No, not Okay. Well. It's still a random chance, but there are people who do pretty well out of doing web forms and comping for cash. Let's see what I've got else on here. You know, you could set up an ironing service. I don't you could iron. Apply... Oh, OK. <laughs> do you? No. All right. You could do, do party planning. Lots of people enjoy being party planning, yeah. bringing people around. You could be a TV extra. There's loads of things out there. A little yeah. bit of creative imagination. We're not talking big bucks. Work pays better than anything else. But if you don't, you may be able to bring in a few hundred quid extra mm -hmm. by some of those. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Sounds exciting. Check yeah. it out before yeah. next time. Thank you. Martin will focus on the financial worries facing the other family members, such as debt and savings, in the coming weeks. You're going to have to think about work and those other boost your income tactics that we discussed about. And Anne-Marie and Graham will try to boost their income, but to achieve real gains, they'll have to make cutbacks. And that's what Martin will tackle in next week's Money Watch. Bye. 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 And for all Martin's tips and a lot more besides, you can go to the Money Watch website, bbc.co.uk slash moneywatch. That's almost all we've got time for here in Birmingham. Tough times ahead, but there's lots we can do to make them more manageable. So last words of advice, Paul. If you're in and out of work, as many people will be, make sure you're not paying too much tax. The revenue makes hundreds of millions of pounds of mistakes for people in and out of work. And also, in or out of work, check your benefits. There's billions of pounds unclaimed. They are being cut, but they're still there. So check you're getting what you're entitled to. Linda? Well, if you feel entrepreneurial and want to have a go, this is actually a great time. There are a number of measures in the budget designed to promote self-employment. So, for instance, if you start a business outside of London and the South East, you do not pay employers national insurance on the first 10 employees. And if you get a profit from your business, you only pay 10% entrepreneurial tax on the first £5 million of earnings. So, lots of great businesses have been started during recessions because it's lean and I can think of a number of them which have been great successes and you could be the next CEO of HP. So there are opportunities out there. Yes and if you really need more, more money start work in your spare time. Do a bit of work on the side. The only way to have more money for most people is to work a bit harder or a bit longer. Paul? Linda, thank you very much. Now next week we're in Liverpool where we'll be looking at our spending habits and how to manage them. Could there be shocks ahead for property owners? There's nowhere for people like me to go. We'll show why getting into debt doesn't have to mean a life sentence. And credit cards, they can be tempting, but will reveal the pitfalls you need to look out for. I hardly ever look at the small print. And is it really possible to live with only the bare essentials?